Uh, okay. Thank you all for joining us today. I am Danette Edwards, the founder of Corona Days Professional Development Group. Uh, I am here today with Nicole Merrill. She is going to lead a webinar on how to learn new skills for a career change. Uh, let me tell you what Nicole will cover today. She's going to cover how new technology is changing the skills you need to thrive in the workplace, how to choose a learning experience without getting a degree. This includes online courses, certificates, and boot camps. She's also going to discuss how to make time for learning in a busy schedule and how to embrace a lifelong learning mindset. So Nicole is a four-time and counting career changer. She excels in professional reinvention, a liberal arts graduate. She has written for Four Seasons and National Geographic private jet tours, sole adventure travel packages in New Zealand, designed chat boxes for a tech company, and coached hundreds of professionals through career transitions at Yale School of Management. Nicole's new book, Punch Doubt in the Face, How to Upskill, Change Careers, and Beat the Robots, upgrades career advice for the future of work and shows you how artificial intelligence and automation are reshaping careers and helps you learn the skills to future-proof your career. Nicole loves pinball, rowdy card games, <laughs> foreign languages, sci-fi, and speculative fiction and lively conversations. Now, I just wanna add one more thing here. Uh, Nicole Merrill is the person who uh, posted up before we even really chatted and nominated me for the Business Insider Most Innovative Career Coach. And then many of you uh, piggybacked on that and actually filled out the nomination form and I was selected for the list. So I appreciate you for that, Nicole. You put CDPD on the map. I mean, Business Insider has more readership than the Wall Street Journal now. I know. Well, you put it on the map. <laughs> I just got to say, like, you are such a super connector. And it was, I get so many LinkedIn, like, connections. But your message, I was like, I have to talk to this woman. <laughs> Woman, right and, and so it was like yeah it's your work and your ability to just like connect with people that I was like oh yeah this is amazing so that's all you yeah. well thank you thank you and I'm trying to teach all of our members to become super connectors and grow their networks uh, because it's just been amazing I tell everyone I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole guys but I tell you all and I'll say it again every single person who is presented in CDPD and now we have 36 um, has been someone that I did not know before March, someone I met on LinkedIn, I connected with and they just let me run my mouth. They believed in my vision and they came and they gave to us. So it's just been amazing. Uh, and I will finally have next week, someone that I know and used to manage will present. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, so Nicole would like a dedicated Q&A, so drop your questions. I'm going to try to stream this over to Facebook as she's talking. I'm going to mute myself, turn this over to Nicole and ask you, Nicole, if there's anything I left out about you that you'd like to share, please share it with us. And thank you. I appreciate you for being here. Thanks, Annette. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm so glad to see you again, too. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. So I'm going to share my screen here. And let's see, we're going to go... I'm going to share it. So what I'm going to hope to do here is also share a split screen so you can see my face um, only because let's say this is the part where I'm like, I haven't split my screen before and hmm, I don't see it in here on my option. So you're not going to see my face, your face. Can you just let me know we that see you, can, we can see you, Nicole, and mm -hmm. my yeah. screen? Mm -hmm. your face is oh. on the side of the screen. So you're fine. Perfect. Thanks, right. guys. I thought it was going to be, uh, I thought I had to click it. Oh, whoops. Wrong one. Present. There we are. Oh, wonderful. Where are we at? Yes. Okay. Cool. So new skills, new you. Uh, I changed the title in making this because because sometimes that's just what happens when you're in development, updating things. Um, how to learn new st skills at any stage of your career. Uh, also for career change, it's going to cover both today. Something you should know about me before I get started is I do tend to get very excited, which means I talk a little bit faster. And so I'm working on slowing it down, but I don't always succeed. So feel free to drop those questions in there and I'm going to leave plenty of time to, to answer them as I go. Um, so 
you gave a great introduction, Danette. So uh, I like to call this my adventure story. I am a four-time career changer. Uh, something you should know about me too. I transitioned into tech only recently. I was 39 years old and I transitioned into an AI startup. That means I was working at a startup um, that works on artificial intelligence, specifically working on chatbots. Chatbots are the software that mimic human language that you interact with online. And sometimes those chatbots are really great and other times they're terrible. Um, so I got a job actually designing those chatbots. That is writing the scripts and looking about how looking at how they interact with people. And it's a long story how I got into it, but um, it's just part of my career adventure um, and what I am um, about following my curiosity. And that's what led to multiple career change. I did write a book, uh, as we mentioned, I wrote it because I had seen all of these headlines in 2016 about robots were going to take our jobs. And I was like, wait, what? What do you mean robots are going to take our jobs? How? And I ended up on a really deep dive into what that actually means in getting beyond the hype of robots taking our jobs. And as a result, I made a book out of it. And the book really focuses on the first part, which is what's actually happening to the workforce and how businesses are changing and the impact that has on you um, as an employee. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about in the first part of this presentation. And then the next part of the book is really focused on how do you learn new skills without necessarily going back to school? So how do you navigate a huge landscape of learning opportunities that are online courses, that are boot camps that are certificate programs and so on. It can be really overwhelming. So I really put that into perspective and I'm gonna dive into that in this talk today. So this is really for anyone, if you're gonna make a career change, this is super helpful. If you're just looking to learn some new skills at work, also super helpful. So maybe you've seen some of these headlines before about robots. These are actually recent robot headlines about Microsoft's laying off journalists to replace them with AI. Um, another one from Business Insider, AI is set to eliminate middle management eight years. A funny thing about being a futurist is that there really all you got to do is is predict the future and not and you're not held accountable to it right you just need an audience a prediction and someone to read it right your audience I guess and these things where they say they're going to eliminate jobs in eight years aren't necessarily accurate and when you see a picture like this of like this robot overlord and you know some circuitry and numbers it can be really off putting all right and I think a lot of people are like yeah yeah okay sure robots aren't going to take my job and as someone who wrote a book uh, that has the title in the title, um, Beat the Robots, I get asked a lot, are robots really going to take our jobs? And I appreciate the question because it gives me a chance to tell you that no, robots will likely not take your job. In fact, it's not robots at all. You're not going to show up to work one day and turn to your robot coworker and be like, what's up? You know, like it's not like that. What's actually happening is that software using artificial intelligence and machine learning, machine learning is part of artificial intelligence, is going to change how we work in every industry. This, um, some of them are automation platforms. So that is, this is software that can do repetitive work instead of humans doing it. You can program a computer to do it. And artificial intelligence is essentially smart software that can learn and get better over time and can slowly learn to do some of the tasks that we are doing in our work, um, everyday work. So the takeaway here isn't really that robots are going to take your jobs. It's that software is changing how we work. Some really good examples of this. Um, administrative assistance. So fun fact, before I was anything that uh, all my multiple career changes, I started out doing a lot of front desk, receptionist, and admin work. I'm a firm believer that administrative assistants are the power bro brokers in an organization. Be, good, be kind to them because they can often get you um, where you need to go. Um, administrators of assistants, though, are um, there are becoming fewer of them in part because of new technology. So think about some of those things. We have um, Candly, if you think about that, like someone can just send a link and we schedule it. Um, intelligent voice assistants for travel. So you can ask Siri to book you travel or Alexa to book you travel. Um, these are things that traditionally administrative assistants have done. Um, food ordering, you can do the same. Speech to text. So for note taking, if you have assistants that are doing um, meeting note taking, you can essentially record it, convert it to text. Expense reports that are being filed um, through apps like Expensify reduce the need for a human to do um, the administrative assistant tasks. Now, will it completely replace administrative assistants? No, probably not. But there, the result is that there will be fewer need for administrative assistants. And if that's your path, it's usually a stepping stone to executive assistant um, or, some, or a job that you take because maybe you're in between jobs and you just need to pay the bills. That was me. Um, this this is going you're going to have fewer opportunities to do this job and um, the the screenshot here is of a service called x.ai this was actually my first 
first interaction with an intelligent assistant that is um, a program that's powered by artificial intelligence. And this is called Amy. And essentially you copy Amy on your email to someone about a schedule and then Amy will automatically respond and do all the scheduling for you in, in everyday language like this. And that's a pretty powerful technology, but you could see how that might reshape an administrative assistant's job. Recruiting, this is a really good example here. There are now chatbots that conduct traditional phone screen interviews. Side note, that's the job I used to do is design those chatbots. Um, there is also programs that will review and analyze your interview performance. So you may do an interview um, on, the, on a video like this, and then an algorithm will analyze how well you've done in that interview. And a recruiter may never even interview you. They'll just see your score. Now, it is problematic, that technology. I am not going to get into that right now because I don't have time for that. Um, but this is the kind of technology that's reshaping um, jobs. And you can imagine if you're a recruiter, if you're not doing interviews and you're not doing phone screens, they say that you might be focusing more on some of those other tasks, but it could also mean that there's fewer recruiters out there. Or it might mean that as a recruiter, you need to know how to work with this software. So there's also algorithms out there that predict your likelihood of job hopping. I just throw that in there because that's another one of those weird technologies that, that are already on the market and people are using. And again, think about a manager. If they're hiring somebody, if your score comes up that you're a job hopper, they might choose not to hire you right? That's something as a, as a manager, you want to know what that product is, how to use it, and then also know where maybe some of the biases in that product and some of the limitations of that product. Again, I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm just giving a general overview. So the future is already here. That's your takeaway here. This is not robots and AI are not something in the future. They are happening now and they're fundamentally reshaping our work. This means that the skills required to do your job and future jobs are increasingly digital. That means um, you need to know how to work with software and diverse platforms. That used to be just something that was like limited to IT, right? They handle the software, you do your job. And now we're seeing these are all being integrated. Modern organizations are powered by data. Data. We all have heard about how we're producing a lot of data in, in the tools that we use, the products that we use, um, in our interactions with with um, with sorry, with companies, right? If you're buying, if you're buying something online, that data is going to be tracked and used to enhance marketing efforts and so on. And so you, if you're in management or looking to go into management, need to learn how to work with data. So these digital skills and data fluence are really part of the future of work. And I bring this up because these are the kind of skills that we can forget about if we're not already working in them. And as someone who got my degree, let's see, just about 20 years ago ish, my undergraduate degree, I didn't learn any of this in school. So it's really uh, eye opening when I started learning about these skills to, to think about like, wow, how is that? What do I need to do to get these skills? Now, when I, I posted here, this, uh, the skills that most companies want in 2020, this comes from LinkedIn. If you look at that list there, we've got hard skills and soft skills. I tend to call soft skills power skills because there's nothing soft about them, okay? They are power skills. So look at that list right now, and I want you to think, um, look at that list and think what skills you have on that list. Give you a second there. Okay. Hopefully, ideally, you have a combination of skills from both sides of that list because the most su successful employees now and going forward in the future can combine soft skills with hard skills, right? Um, I, you know, it's odd that sales is under the hard skills because kind of I'd put that in the soft skills, but nowadays a lot of sales are selling uh, software as a service. So platforms, you it's a common app, common product that's abbreviated with SaaS, S A. S-A-A-S, and a lot of sales positions are now open selling these platforms to other companies. So that's probably why it's in the hard skill, uh, skills there. And then some of these um, in the hard skills like analytical reasoning is really a bigger bucket. That's kind of that reflection of working with data and being able to interpret data. So hopefully you've got some of those skills on there, but that just gives you kind of a map to what employers are looking for. You obviously don't have to have all those skills. I'm never going to get the skill in blockchain, I don't think. <laughs> it's not really an interest of mine, but some of the skills I've learned in the last couple of years um, do include cloud computing, design, business analyst, and so on. Those are not skills I would say that I had necessarily seven years ago, but I made an effort to learn about them. I point this out because we're seeing the trend in the market is going towards hybrid jobs. Hybrid jobs are jobs that combine skill sets that never used to be found in the same job, such as marketing and stats, analysis, or design and programming. 
right? Think about the IT job before. Usually it was like IT did the computer stuff and then you were set to do, you know, maybe focus on program management, right? And you didn't really interact. And now we're seeing those jobs start coming together. You know, IT people need to have people skills. They need to be able to help people. They need to be able to explain their decisions. They need to be able to work with people outside of their department. So collaboration, which is a big soft skill and so on. So these hybrid jobs, um, some examples down there are product manager, client success partner. A client success partner is a is a funny term, but basically it's it's customer service for organizations who have um, bought a platform, uh, a piece of technology, and it's helping them either implement it or um, or work with it in the first couple of months and so on. And so it takes it's it's almost like an internal consultant, but you're consulting on a piece um, a platform, and that's usually software. I use software and platform pretty interchangeable interchangeably right now. So. When you look at, I promise this is the only real chart I have in this presentation. I hate doing charts, but this really goes to show kind of what the hybrid employee look like. It, it looks like it's a combination of having technical skills, soft skills, and analytical skills. Now, hybrid jobs right now, according to Burning Glass Technologies, one in eight jobs across 250 occupations are hybrid jobs. And we're seeing them across industries. This is not something that is specific to tech. I have seen AI chatbots used in higher education. I have seen predictive analytics being used in the justice system, um, often unfairly. I've seen architects that are using virtual reality. And last year I had a graphic designer to do my website and she told me she was using her skills now to design augmented reality for Snapchat filters. And I thought that's a really cool job right there. So what we're seeing is all of these, this merging of these skill sets in new ways. It creates, creates new jobs, it creates new opportunities, but it fundamentally changes the way that you work. And so it's important to to point that out, because if we look to the future and we look at like what we need to learn and where we want to go, this is the future. And so if you maybe, maybe you're proficient, you're really good in the soft skills category, but you haven't much had much experience with analytical skills, or maybe you're, you're not as comfortable with software, then it's time to look at a, um, a learning path that might help you learn some of those skills and vice versa. If you're a person who's like, yeah, I can code all day long, but you can't write, it's time to look at you know, maybe boosting those writing skills so you can make sure that you are fully employed and getting paid uh, well in the future. Last quote on those hybrid jobs. Um, fully one quarter of all occupations in the US economy show strong signs of hybridization. And they almost universally are the fastest growing and highest paying jobs. They're also the most resistant to automation. That is, machines in the future, software in the future aren't likely to disrupt those jobs because again, it's hybrid, it's soft skills, analytical and technical. Some of these jobs are new, some are versions of existing jobs, but all of them pose different challenges for workers, students, employers, and educators. Takeaway here, other than hybrid jobs are growing and they, they, are, they do pay better, is that we're in this huge transformation right now. All of us, the businesses, the educators, us as an employees, and it's really messy. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay that it's messy. Um, this is kind of a messy slide, speaking of messy, I hate having chaos slides, but this really demonstrates the anatomy of a hybrid job here. Um, this is a, the, the title of this job is a senior client success enablement manager, which terrible title, much of big mouthful there. Um, but it's similar to that customer success manager that I talked about before, but this is actually in training. And you can see here just how this breaks down for a hybrid job. You've got collaboration up there in kind of the pink. You've got communication, writing and presenting required in the green You've got in the blue, the software proficiency. We're not talking just Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. We're talking Salesforce, which is a very powerful automation software and CRM. Um, and then experience with L&D software specifically too. And they want experience working for a SaaS company. Again, that's software as a service. So, um, oh, what did I miss something? Ah, data fluency down there. The measure training effectiveness using methods such as focus groups, surveys, and so on. And, you know, we tend to think of like measurement and metrics as, as maybe for program managers and maybe it's for, you know, someone who is in IT, but data fluency and your ability to interpret data um, and use it for decision making is one of the top skills for future management and mid-career professionals. So you can see that reflected here in this job. Now, this is a mid-career job uh, in the training field. This is the L&D field. Um, as someone who does a lot of training, 
I was surprised to see this because we tend to think of training as, you know, curriculum design, people skills, presenting, teaching, things like that, those soft skills, which are so powerful, right? And here you have all these other skills as well coming into a traditionally what would be maybe a, a soft skill job. So something to keep in mind as you think about the future and what jobs will look like and what jobs you want to take. So what does this mean? We're all career misfits right now. That's, that's what I want to, that's my message to you right there. If you're feeling like, oh my God, what now? Or yeah, I've been seeing this. Finally, I know that this is what I've been saying and seeing. Let me validate you. Um, we are all career misfits right now. And here's why, because this is what we were told. We were told if we go to school, we get a dream job with a clear career path, then maybe we're probably going to get promoted. And then we'll, maybe we'll get a career change or a professional degree, but maybe not. And then we're just going to make money right? That, that top one there is just us making all the money. And I tell you what, when I first met with Annette, this is what we talked about, like that, that this just is not true, right? This is not the reality, but we were all told this, you know, when we were younger. And so most of us anyways, I know I was because from previous generations, that's what you did. You got in, you stayed with the company, they took care of you and you were set as long as you got that degree. And that's just not the reality anymore. Um, this is a lot more what a career might look like. Some of me is in there. Um, some of uh, the people I've coached in the past are in there. This, this kind of mess of like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to get a job, but then I'm just going to take any job I want. Cause I've got student loans. That was definitely me. Um, you know, maybe I'll learn new skills, but I'm going to change jobs because this wasn't right. Or this job wasn't right. Um, maybe you'll take it a side hustle. Maybe you'll go back to school again to get a master's degree. I did that. Um, still didn't quite get me where I wanted, you know, and then sometimes we just change our minds. This is something that I'm actually, uh, like to talk about because we change our minds, right? And that's normal and it's okay to change your mind. But in the old school narrative, we don't give space for people to change their mind right? Because sometimes we get on a path and it's like, this doesn't work for my life anymore. This is what it feels like. I don't know about you. Uh, this is the point in like, if I, I do this in person, <laughs> pre-COVID, uh, when we actually, I see a lot of nodding heads. Yeah. If it feels like that, let me validate you. That is real. I still feel like this. And I can tell you back in the day when I was a career coach, I um, also career coached executives and I would have executives tell me, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have no idea what's going on. Everything doesn't make sense anymore about what I'm supposed to do. And it was like, yeah, I mean, yes, this is accurate, right? We're all feeling some sort of, of this. If you're not good for you, give that energy to other people. <laughs> um, here's what I want you to take away from this. The new reality is lifelong learning. You may have heard this concept before. It's the idea that you're constantly learning, staying curious, picking up new skills as you go through your career. Um, this again is an approximation. You don't have to do this all the time, but ideally what you're doing is you're taking on new skills as you progress in your career. And progress doesn't have to look like up. You'll notice this is not always up. Sometimes we dip. Um, sometimes we get laid off, uh, things like that. So the idea here is that you're constantly learning in order to stay current and ensure that you can do those hybrid jobs and that you're not at risk for automation or a machine, a piece of software on um, being able to uh, do your job. Okay. Lifelong learning is the mindset, but learning new skills is that commitment to action, adaptability and change. Now I point this out because for a lot of people I've talked to when I give these talks are like, whoa, whoa, I like, I don't like this. And I said, that's totally fair, um, but it's happening. And so really embrace it because it, once you start embracing this change and start embracing your curiosity about what's happening and learning, things start to get super exciting. I promise you. Um, but it's, it's, you know, we talk about lifelong learning. That's the mindset. That's the acceptance of everything and that ability to say, yes, I'm okay with learning new things, right? Um, I want to learn new things. I'm not just going to set it and forget it with my career, but I'm actually going to take action, right? You are in charge of your skill development, not your employer. I point this out because a lot of times in the old school mentality, we wait for our employer to tell us what's the next move, the promotion, the new job, you are in charge of it. And this is particularly true with skill development. So seeking out learning opportunities, whether they're big opportunities, like taking an online course or a new program or small opportunities, like, you know, listening to a podcast from your industry, those are micro learning opportunities. You're in charge of that, uh, not your employer. And that's a, it's a huge shift from previous generations. So. I want to talk about learning paths for big changes since I talked about career changes in the title here. This screenshot is actually of some of the pro the platforms out there that help you uh, learn new skills. And this is only a snapshot. I included, the, included this to show you how much 
um, how many opportunities are out there, but also to validate anyone who feels overwhelmed. Um, I'm going to talk today about boot camps and online courses and a little bit about YouTube, but I'm not going to cover all of it. Uh, that's why I wrote a book. Essentially, one third of my book is helping you navigate all your options. But I am going to talk about a couple of them today to help you get on, on the right path. And if you're thinking about making a big change and understand some of the nuances between them and ideally give you some homework to do. So that way you can um, work towards learning some new skills. All right, so boot camps is the first one. You've probably seen this term before. Most of them are digital boot camps. They teach design, data skills, digital skills. So if you want to learn data analysis because you want to be a better ma uh, manager, or maybe you're like, I have always wanted to go into design. I need to learn how to build websites or you know build apps. That's an option too. They are um, a lot of them have financing available. They didn't used to be so expensive. Now I think the last one I looked at was fifteen thousand dollars, which is my goodness, it's a lot of money. But they're offering creative financing op opportunities like income share agreements. That is, you don't pay until you actually have a job, and then there's a percentage of your salary goes to paying off um, your your uh, educational opportunity. So I debate on ISAs. I'm not going to go into them right now, but my takeaway for you is always read the fine print on them. These are fast paced. They're intensive. Some of them are 40 hour weeks, um, 40 hour a week learning opportunities for um, six weeks. Some of them are three months. Some of them are six months, but they are intense and they go very fast. So you're diving into the deep end when you go into them. A lot of them offer job search support and sometimes a job guarantee. Now you're going to see me say sometimes because the world of boot camps is wide open. There is a lot of variety. And we've seen boot camps fail. We've seen boot camps fail learners, that is not be able to guarantee jobs. And then we've seen boot camps fail learners because they weren't, they didn't provide a good learning experience. So if you're looking at boot camps, you really have to do your due diligence in terms of what they offer and if their claims are true. And thankfully there are, um, there are websites out there that'll help you evaluate um, boot camps to figure out which ones are the good ones. So essentially ratings for boot camps. And I'll show those in the next slide. Um, variable outcomes, right? Again, you're going to get a lot of variety. So you got to do your, your research. The thing I like about these is that they offer a free course so you can try them out. And I got to give a shout out to Adrian in the group because I see Adrian. Adrian's actually the one that pointed to the course I'm going to show you now. Adrian is just like posting all of these online courses and certifications and just really good stuff about how to learn new skills. And it's so cool to see all the things that she finds. So shout out to Adrian in the, in the group because I love seeing um, what she posts. Uh, this one is the one she posted before and I'm gonna, hopefully it's gonna load here. This is at Flatiron School and you can do a boot, uh, boot camp prep online. It's a free course and so you can get a feel for the course itself. So that way you can figure out like, is online learning for me? Does this make sense? Do I even like this type of stuff because you may be like, hey, I want to learn to code and you get in and you're like, this is terrible. That's okay. That's part of the learning experience, trying something new, realizing it's not a fit and not doing it. Totally acceptable, right? We got to give ourselves space to explore and fail if we if, if it doesn't fit. That's completely okay. So that's why these coding bootcamp prep courses, almost every single one of them offer some form of a free course. You can take advantage of it. Again, this one came from Adrian's post and I really appreciated that. Um, so back to back to boot camps. You can evaluate them. These are the uh, some of the best ones. Career Karma, Karma is my absolute favorite. He is doing incredible work there. Um, they're working to get people uh, reskilled by donating laptops to people in need of laptops because it's hard to do online learning if you don't have a laptop right now. Plus, you can get matched to a boot camp there. So highly recommend their website. Um, Switchboard and Course Report also offer ratings for boot camps as well. Online learning. Okay. Now here's the part where I tell you, I could do an entire webinar on online learning. Um, it was certainly one of the most challenging, I would say, um, chapters to write in my book because it's just such a wide range. We've got platforms that offer online courses like Coursera, edX. You've got universities who are offering online courses through degree programs. And now universities partner with platforms like Coursera to offer master's degree programs. So it's it's just kind of a mess out there. Um, you have free and paid options. You've got standalone courses, which you take one free course, fine. You've got specializations, that is a bunch of courses together where you can you know, essentially learn a bunch of new skills in a field and hopefully transition into something new or maybe upgrade your current job. And then you've got degree programs, oh my. Certificates and certifications are also part of online learning. 
this is the part where I jump to this slide to tell you that certifications and certificates are not the same. They're used a lot of the time interchangeably, but it is very important that you know the difference. Certification is, is offered by an industry association or trade group, and it's going to assess your uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities to do a specific job. Okay, this is this is notable because what you'll see is that in um, job in job ads, you'll see certifications required. Whereas with certificates, these are short term, they're usually offered by an educational institution, and they're based on completed coursework. Note the difference between the two. One assesses your skills and knowledge, one assesses your ability to create uh, pass the course. Now, you're going to get knowledge in the course, of course, um, but they are different. And what we found, what the research found, again, from Burning Glass Technologies, is that certificates don't show up in the job um, requirements. And a good example of this, this is for certifications. This is Salesforce, really popular certification out there. You, you take the courses, you do an exam, and then you're certified. And you can see here, this was a job for a Salesforce administrator, and you can see uh, the requirement here that you have. So you can see how this certification would pay off. Um, and that's not necessarily the case with certificates. So it's something to keep in mind if you don't want to pay extra for the certificate. The value of a certificate is, of course, signaling to a to an employer on your resume or LinkedIn that, hey, you have some knowledge in this area. So it could be good for someone changing careers. This is an example of a certificate program from Coursera. They're known for their certificates. Um, notice the language. You can earn a career credential. What is that? Um, apply your knowledge to hands-on projects. That's good. So you can show your skills and get, um, and then it provides a pathway to an industry recognized certification. So that's, that's actually not you doing, you don't get the certification, you just get a certificate. And I think that's important to note. A certificate is not a job guarantee. Okay. It's not a guarantee in, in salary boost and so on. So keep that in mind. Side note. Google messed my entire presentation up because Google has IT professional certificates and they're doing, they're doing amazing things, but, um, and, and connecting people certainly with giving them college credits by doing it. They're helping them get certified and so on. But again, it's kind of an in-between between certificate and certification, but they are using the term certificate. And if you were like, Nicole, I'm lost completely. That's okay. It's confusing. Your takeaway here is that certificates are not a job guarantee and that you should do your due diligence when looking at a certificate and thinking about what you want to get out of them. Um, so it's the wild, wild west with online learning. So here's how to break it down. It's helpful to know your learning style. If you're thinking about taking an online course to learn new skills, think about how you prefer to learn. And I've got kind of a you know, a dichotomy here, but these don't have to be that way. Um, do you prefer self-directed learning or would you like an instructor to lead your course? I tell you this because I'm in a course right now on Coursera, it's a certificate course, and it's IBM Applied AI, and it's all corporate marketing videos that for from YouTube. That's what the course is. And I'm really disappointed in it. And it's no instructor at all. And I didn't do, I didn't know that before. And so I'm kind of bummed that I'm actually going through this process to, to get the certificate. So um, do your due diligence beforehand and think about what kind of style you want. And sometimes you can jump into a learning style, or an online course and realize what your learning style is afterwards. That's, that's also part of the, the process. Um, Learning communities, they really help you get through the process. But maybe you're like, no, I've, I've got my, I'm good. I know how to learn. I don't need a community. That's fine too. Um, so figure out what works for you. I'm going through these a little quickly here because I want to leave time. But um, these are what works for me. I, so, I selected these after doing a lot of online courses. I want something that instructor-led learning community, I'd like it free. <laughs> um, I need something flexible. That's easy right now with COVID. Um, Curated, I like curated materials. You know, you could DIY, you can build your entire course by yourself. There's so much out there. Um, micro learning, I like little things I can dip into during the day and just watch a video. And then I also like a full program where it's like they've laid out this is exactly what you're going to do. Um, then there's passive learning versus applied learning. I tend to lean towards applied learning because I want projects and I follow follow the advice of showing your work. Employers want to see what you can do. They want to see it in portfolios, on websites. If you want to become a writer, maybe you want to become a content marketing writer, you need to be able to write for the web. That means you should have on a website with writing samples, right? It's not enough to take an online course that says, I can write, right? I mean, obviously it's not your online course, but write a content marketing course, right? That's not enough. You need to be able to write and show your work in order to be competitive. So that's something to think about. A lot of these online courses offer applied learning. So that's project-based work, but not all of them. So keep that in mind. So if you're interested in online courses, 
Did I skip a slide? Ah, there it is. So online courses can be a very overwhelming as you sort through them. So here's some guiding questions. What do you want to get out of your online course? This is one of the most powerful questions you can ask yourself. Is it new skills? Do you want a new job? Do you just want new knowledge? You just want to take a course because you're interested in the subject. I've done that. I'm, I'm actually, there's an intro to script writing that I'm super interested in that I'm just going to take, not to get a new skill, but I'm interested in it. Okay. Do you want to signal to future employers, right? That goes back to, you know what, maybe the certificate doesn't help you get a job, but maybe you have no experience in an area and having a certificate on your resume and LinkedIn can give a signal to employers, hey, yes, you are interested in this industry. That's that's a good enough reason to do a certificate program, okay? So really focus on what is it you want to get out of an online course. Here's a list of them. Screenshot that there are so many out there. I want you to explore them and get into them and figure out what fits for you. So a lot of text. Let me break it down. Evaluate your learning path. I'm going to go back to it. Set expectations before you start this process. What do you want to get out of the learning path? New skills, new job, new knowledge, okay? Whether you're doing a boot camp, whether you're going to watch videos online, whatever it is, what do you want to get out of it? Write it down, okay? That way you can make sure you're going back to, to your goals. Um, seek out paths that highlight outcomes. Look for applied projects. Try it first if possible. Even these online learning courses like Coursera, you can try, you can try a course for free right, to see if you like it or not. They are going to prompt you to sign up for that certificate. You do not have to. You can audit. They just make it hard to find. Um, if you're taking a boot camp, you can speak with course alumni about their experience. I know I visited a, I visited a boot camp actually when I was, I was doing some research in uh, Portugal. Delightful. And I went to an alumni panel for a boot camp called Le Wagon. They're mostly European based. They're a global boot camp. And I listened to the alumni talk about their experience. And it was so cool to see like how excited they were and hear what they actually got to work on and then how they're applying that skill, those skills in their jobs now. So highly recommend seeing if you can talk to alumni. Investigate the paths that graduates took after the program. This is not always easy to do. OK, but this is when we go back to kind of the super connecting. So if you, you notice someone maybe took an online course and made a career change, go talk to them, ask them what it was like. Um, this is something I've done on my podcast, podcast, 50 Conversations, where I've asked people who changed careers, you know, how they did it. And then a lot of them went through a boot camp or an online course. And I asked them, what was it like? Right. What was it like to look for a job or how did they view the credential? and so on. So those are powerful questions. So that way you're not making a choice based, you know, um, without information. Because again, there's a huge variety out there, variable outcomes, and, you know, not all courses are created equal. That's kind of the downside of having all of these options. There's a lot of pop-up new educators in the space and a lot of marketing. So you have to do your due diligence. I want you to choose past the build in demand skills. I talked about them before, but it's the analytical, the digital and the power skills, right? If you wanna get better at public speaking, take a course and then just start, start giving presentations, get online, host a webinar, right? And, and practice because it is a skill, it's a power skill, but that's how you learn those, those um, applied learning experiences. And I tell you what, these in-demand skills, you know, they're going to pay off later on in life. I can certainly speak to uh, public speaking being probably my favorite skill, but I learned um, quite young how to do it and um, have been doing it for over 20 years. And it has gotten me into more jobs than I can count at this point. So find your skill, work on it, um, get better at it and commit to learning something new as well to complement that skill. I'm going to talk quickly about YouTube University. Uh, this is what uh, one of my guests actually on the podcast called it. Uh, she taught herself uh, some design skills from YouTube. The benefit, obviously free, curiosity driven, right? You can just go down that rabbit hole. Easy to digest. It's passive learning, so you're not necessarily applying it, but it can be really useful as support material for online courses. I'm currently learning data science, and it is hard. I am a liberal arts grad with no background in math and stats is incredibly boring to me. So I am using the crash course statistics learning path on YouTube and it is amazing. Their videos are super helpful. They're better than what I'm getting in some of these online courses and I love them and I don't know what I would do without them. So YouTube is absolutely a way to learn new skills. My only thing to you is make sure that you're somehow showing that you're learning things from YouTube. Either you're writing about it, maybe you're taking what you learn and applying it to a project and telling your boss that or, or, or something else, but I want you to be able to show those skills off. But it's certainly um, a path to learning new skills. 
find companies that embrace learning. I know we've got job seekers in here. Side note, I'm also a job seeker right now. I may be an expert, but I am also looking for a job. Um, and I look for companies that embrace learning. And the way that I know they embrace learning, learning stipend. This is like one of the coolest benefits that I've been seeing lately. Um, this is from Rasa. They are an open source chatbot software program. They give you a thousand dollars of personal development a year. How, how great is that? Like in education paid days, sign me up, right? That ex being that explicit about it is so powerful. So now I know I'm like, yes, I would like to work for you among the other amazing things pay trips to Berlin, they're a Berlin company, swoon. Um, so that's, that's, that's an incredible uh, benefit to have. And that's how you know that's a company that's gonna embrace learning. Cause what you don't want is to be in a company that doesn't embrace learning. I've got plenty of friends and colleagues that are in dead end companies that are say, my boss doesn't care, doesn't want me to learn anything new, isn't helpful, won't invest in me, all of that. You know what I say to you? Get out of those companies. That's where your skills go to die. Okay. Choose companies like this. There was another one, um, Degreed, I learned about. They have a $100 a month learning stipend. You, They will give you $100 to apply to whatever you want. I talked to someone who was learning Spanish. I thought that was amazing. So pick learning com uh, companies that embrace learning. Those are often you can find those companies on um, their benefits page. They will tell you that. Or in this case, it was in the job description. There we are. There we are. So powerful activity to do right here. Reflect on your interests, okay? Let's bring it back to the basics. I gave you all this information. What would you like to learn? This is a simple curiosity exercise. What would you like to learn? Who do you wanna meet? What do you wanna know more about? My journey, my recent career transition into the AI space started because I was like, wait, what? What do I, I need to learn more about AI. What is this? And it's such a huge field and can re be really intimidating, can feel that way if you don't have a tech background or a coding background, which I do not have. I'm liberal arts, languages, writing, huh, you know? And then I started thinking about who do I want to meet? And then I would talk to people. I just emailed someone yesterday um, at Microsoft and I was like, hey, I got to know more about what you work on because I saw her present. Okay. So it's powerful to reflect on your interests. And what's great is once you do this, you get better at doing it and better at doing it. And it starts to become more natural. Some of you might already be natural curiosity people and know this. Shout out to you guys. And then lastly, um, I'm going to leave you with some micro learning. Micro learning is kind of a hot, hot word right now, but I really like it because um, it's this idea that we don't have to necessarily undertake a big program or take an online course, you know, in order to learn and keep learning in our days. Um, and so this is the 20 minutes a day challenge. It's, it's uh, picking something from this list or something that, that you're learning from. Okay, and do it every day. And this could be something like listening to a podcast. Um, you could find applied learning projects at work. So maybe get yourself on a project where you're challenged and you, you haven't used that skill before. You haven't used a skill in a long time, right? And you're having to work at it to learn that skill. Join a Slack or Facebook community that supports learning. Again, you know, I'm seeing it in here. I've seen the LinkedIn homework. I've seen, you know, it, the, the courses that are being posted. Like it, this is like, uh, this is supportive community. Right. And there's Slack groups as well for industry that I'm in that, that teach things. So, so join, find more of those. That's learning. Jump on a webinar. Um, ask questions. This is a powerful one. You know, if you want to, you've got something that you're dying to ask, ask them. Don't wait. That's learning too. Take a free online course. They're out there. Um, or ask a mentor to explain a concept to you. I did this one day um, with someone who was much younger. He was in his 20s, early 20s, and I had him uh, explain data science to me. I wanted the big picture because I'd been kind of piecemeal learning about it, and I didn't understand the big picture, and he did it. And it was amazing. So don't underestimate your colleagues who, you know, maybe like aren't getting a chance to talk to people <laughs> and, and teach, like find them and learn from them. So that's your takeaway there. I will say another one that's not on this list is industry newsletters. Sign up for them. There's so much good content out there right now. People that are writing, um, Substack is, is a platform right now that's allowing people to have a bigger reach and write um, a lot more and um, finance their writing as well. So you're seeing a lot of good content coming out of there, especially for industry newsletters. You can learn so much from them. All right, that's it. Um, I will take questions. This is how you can find me. I get a lot of LinkedIn requests without messages. And so in order to connect, send me a message, please. And I'll happily connect with you. Um, if you um, want to get my book, it's on my website. Note the double L's. I always throws people off. And my podcast has been on hiatus, but I'm coming back soon. So I will take questions now and stop sharing my screen. All right. I love it, Nicole. Yeah. I love it. Uh, everyone knows if you're a CDPD member. So we have some. I'm glad. 
in the chat that are not CDPD members that when they connect with our presenters, they have to send something. They need to send, a, you know, a message. It, it's simple as I saw yeah. your, you know, I saw your presentation or thank you for your presentation. I'm a CDPD member. Let's connect, you know? Yeah. Uh, yes. So we have a bunch of questions in the chat and then I have a few. Uh, before my regular questions, I have a few from the presentation about, okay. you know, what you said. So I can read these so that everyone can uh, see them and then you can answer. And okay, then guys, exactly. if you have anything else, please drop them either in the Q&A or the chat. All right. So good afternoon, Nicole. I love your energy and accuracy covering this topic. You mentioned that robots will not be taking our jobs. However, where does all of the AI leave pre previous generations that did not grow up using technology. And that would be me. I'm 46. <laughs> I mean, I didn't ask that question. That's from Rhonda. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm glad that was asked. Like it is. Um, so a couple of things I say, robots aren't going to take our job for some people. I think for the most people, it's not going to take our jobs, but for manufacturing, we do see that happening a lot of the time. And certainly in retail, we're seeing kiosks mm -hmm. show up instead of people. So I, I do like to point that out because it's, but then, yeah. So for those who haven't learned about it, start learning about it. And that's that like that's as direct as I can be on it, because it you're right. Um, we didn't learn about this. I didn't learn about this in school at all. And here's the thing. It's still very much gatekeeping. Right. There's a lot of people and I that like when I started learning this, I was like, I don't understand this. You're only talking to engineers. Mm. Right. And so but the good news is that things have gotten better. And I will point you to an online course. There's a couple of online courses. I've been actually reviewing them right now to actually see what they're teaching um, elements of AI is one out of Finland. That's a more hands-on learning one. It's going to involve some math, but it's designed by the Finnish government to educate their own citizens on AI. So mm. it's called Elements of AI. The other one is an introduction um, to AI. I think it's called a AI for Everyone, and it's on Coursera. I haven't reviewed that one yet, but that's another big one that I'm going to review. So I would say these are like fundamentals. And then I would say, um, there's, uh, you know, certainly what I'd like you to do is like pick a vertical, right? My, my entry point was HR. I wanted to understand how is HR affecting, AI affecting HR. And so I started there. And don't get hot, caught up in the language or the math or anything like that. It's kind of like a foreign language where you're like, try to take in the context. How is it being used? What is the software? Go look at the software's website, right? What does it do? How do they sell it? That's how you start learning about it. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, all right. Our second question is, Nicole, what do you do to unwind from the use of technology? Many individuals, including myself, feel a bit fatigued after sitting behind a computer all day. Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. uh, great question. I recently, <laughs> between this, being unemployed and being in a pand pandemic, uh, <laughs> it, like I've needed it. So I, uh, I've started playing the ukulele. Uh, mm -hmm. I have zero music knowledge. So I was like, yeah, I could do this. Um, so I've been learning that. And honestly, it's so much fun that it's like, it's just fun to do. And then I listen to podcasts a lot that are not at all related to my industry. I, I like listening to things and I play with my kid. My kid's 16 month old. So oh, I play with him a lot yeah. and I socialize with friends. Mm. Distant socialization. <laughs> <laughs> um, but certainly those conversations I go back to, I love conversation with people. I love people. And so I, I spend time with them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel concerned with online privacy since we are converting to a virtual world? 100%. Mm -hmm. I could do an entire talk and discussion on privacy and bias in this technology. Mm -hmm. I am actually, that's the side I want to work on. I want to work on um, reducing bias in uh, algorithms and machine learning technology. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm doing all this upskilling. Um, I think privacy is certainly a risk when we think about facial recognition and we think about how it's being deployed. I think about privacy in terms of how much of us are expected to be online, mm. right? If I have such a digital put footprint now and it's a curated one, yeah. right? I think of all the people right now that are coming up, Gen Z and stuff like that, they're quite smart about it. They're quite savvy, but I think millennial, younger millennial generation really has some challenges around stuff that they put out in the beginning, in the early yes, days that are, that are coming yes. up. I used a fake name for a long time for a lot of my online stuff. Mm. Uh, but yes, to, your, to the question, yes, I am concerned. Uh, just piggybacking off of that one, this is one for me. Did you see the new documentary uh, on Netflix about, no. oh gosh, it's Social yes. Dilemma? Yes. Social, yes. yes, it's scary. Yeah, yeah, and I haven't seen it yet. I just haven't, because I consume that content on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. That's my interest, so I didn't 
want to yeah. step into it, but I've been reading about it certainly. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, it's such a good conversation. What I love mm -hmm. is the conversation around it, that people are talking about it because there are some real risks that are happening to both our society and yes. our democracy. And mm -hmm. I think we've seen the headlines, right? Yeah. Um, and it's important that we engage in a conversation, not just the engineers, not just the people working in tech, but the people all in all facets of life because it affects yes. us all. Yeah. Piggybacking on that question about AI, that's another reason why I want more people to learn about it mm -hmm. is because it can't be left alone to the engineers. It has to be, we need more people from diverse backgrounds. I mean, diverse mm -hmm. ethnically, gender, you know, um, experience level, socioeconomic status, um, mm -hmm. expertise. We need all of them involved in this, talking about it, talking about the effects, talking about the impact and being brought into the design process. So yeah. the more you can start learning about it, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and that's something that many of those engineers in this documentary are is saying, and mm -hmm. that they had brought these concerns to whether they were at Google or Facebook or Amazon and that was not what anyone wanted to do. And so, it, I mean, it's, it's controversial, but it is definitely an eye opener. And the other thing I'll say about this is, which is scary as heck, let me not curse, is uh, none of these people allow their children to be on social media. Yep. But these, yep. I mean, the guy who made the like button, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, no. they, they don't allow their children on social media, or if they do, I think one woman did, and it's really, really guarded on what they can do. So this yeah. is interesting. Um, I, ooh, yeah, I, this, this is a common thing that you see the people that work in it. I mean, I will tell you, I don't put pictures on my, my son's face on social media because I worry wow. about facial recognition. Wow. All I'm right. already out there. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out, you there. know, but, yeah. but I think it's real. Um, and piggybacking on that, there's a recommendation, Rabbit Hole by the New York Times was a podcast that was really, really well done on algorithms um, with YouTube and radi radicalization. Mm -hmm. So it's one I highly recommend only because mm -hmm. it, it shows what's happening behind the scenes and they talk to the engineers and kind of how this all, how we got to here. So yeah, that's also a mm -hmm. recommendation. Yeah. All right. I'll look that one up. Uh, yeah. Kind of dystopian, but I think it's important that we see it. You know? Yeah. And we, and we need to. We need to be aware of what's going on behind all this technology that we're most of us are addicted to now. Uh, yes. Big difference between certificate and certification. Thank you. I had no idea there was so much out there for us to create opportunities for ourselves. Uh, that's why we're here at CDPD. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I have to connect you with Diana Royanotis. She's working now, but she will be on this. She will watch this. Diana is our, um, she's self-tech, self-taught tech. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and excellent. yeah, she she wanted to move from the healthcare field and just went looked at job descriptions and saw what she needed to do to be a help desk analyst and just went all over the net and found those resources. Yes. Now, yeah, and she's excelling in her career. She's now she's now level three analyst. Came on as level one, and she with no she has no college background and no tech background. Yeah. And uh, but always wanted to work and wanted to know, was very curious about technology. And she her new goal is to be a sis, the security systems analyst. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 So she's yeah, doing really self-taught to be there now. So she just has a very, very amazing story of how a lay person can do this. And I love that story. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what I think that there's two things. One in my book, I talk about this, how these job descriptions tell many stories. Yeah. They tell you how to get to where you want to be. Yes. You just have to learn how to read them. And that's something that, that, that I break down in the book because we tend to think a job description is something we just look at when we need a job, but it's actually a guide mm -hmm. if you're trying to get to a different career and it can be part of the exploratory process. And then two, you know, you, these sort of, we don't think about these certifications. There's mm -hmm. something nobody taught me about certifications, yeah. but there are powerful paths to good paying mm -hmm. job career security. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And she had shared a resource that, and now I'm, now I'm curious if it was certificates or certification where you can, you can provide to them links to your work or a description of what you've done and you get a certain amount of free either certificates or certifications. I can't remember what it is. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it's, 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 she did two powerful presentations about self, self taught tech. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's such a powerful story. I'm so glad that, that everyone got to hear that story. Yeah. And I'm going to connect the two of you. Uh, all right. So we have, 
Uh, were you bummed out because you were hoping for more human interaction opposed to simply watching the videos? And I guess this is in response to some of your, your self-talk tag. Yeah, I, I'm actually pretty mad about it. I'm going to write a review. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm, yeah, because I found those corporate marketing videos on uh, I, IBM's YouTube channel. I'm like, well, what am I doing in this course? One mm. course, I wrote a Coursera review that was like, this is essentially one giant commercial. So I'm <laughs> you know, and I was pretty mad. I took the course because it's called Applied AI and I wanted to learn how to use IBM Watson. Mm. And yeah, there's a couple of instances in there, but it's not that great, of course. Mm. And to give you a counterpoint, yesterday, Two days ago, I was in a hands-on workshop using um, a competitor, which is uh, Microsoft Azure. Azure. Uh -huh. Azure. And I got way more out of that in mm. uh, four hours for free than I am this course. Wow. So is that going to be mm. the case? Mm. Yeah. yeah. I don't expect in self-directed courses like that to get human interaction, but mm -hmm. I have taken one. I took um, Python for Everybody, which mm -hmm. is an intro course to a coding to Python language, a coding language. And it was a very charismatic teacher, mm. very charismatic professor. And I was like, I like you. I can't connect with you, but <laughs> I like, I like you're, you, you make this accessible and fun. Mm. Whereas a corporate marketing video that literally has the corporate music the whole time oh. overlaid, yeah. and you're like, <laughs> So yeah, to say I was bummed is, is like kind of an understatement. <laughs> wow, such an exciting presentation. Love, love, love this information. I'm so glad. Yes. Uh, then Nicole, please come back to CDPD. Well, guys, Nicole is a very active member of CDPD. She can come back if she'd like. You have an open invite. So if you ever want to come yeah. back, uh, maybe. No, you tell me what you want to hear about. I can dive into any of these subjects. So. Well, I, I'll, I'll ask the group. But one thing that I would love to know more of is your journey mm. you know yeah. like it, it is we have many people in the group who have liberal arts background mm -hmm. uh communication background aspiring yeah. writers yeah. or people who are writing and yes. you know would love to pivot into a tech field so mm -hmm. i would love for you to come back for that but i'll okay. I'll, I'll also ask the group what they what they want to know since you are like diana one of our tech gurus now yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. What do you think, Nicole, mm -hmm. let's say a Udemy or Coursera course giving a certificate or a U.S. university with only a document verifying completion, which would be better and more valued on the job market? Well, I'll go back to two things. One, uh, are you going to get hands-on experience? I think, again, we're going to go back to the show your work. Are you going to be able to show that you've got some skills out of this and can build something, create something? I think that's always, always one of my top things to look for in a course. Um, because usually I'm, I'm taking this as a perspective from like maybe a career change. So that's different than if you are just looking to like show your employer and like, Hey, look, I can do this now. Give me a promotion. Very different. Right. So I would look for that. And then I'd look at like, I mean, I guess I would look at the price because <laughs> that comes into play yeah, yeah. because I have seen some of these I'm seeing master's degrees being offered through Coursera and stuff like that they're still upwards of you know fifteen thousand dollars twenty thousand yeah. dollars so what are Real we doing money here? yeah online learning was supposed to bring it down mm -hmm. that that said uh I'm just going to piggyback on that thought and talk about uh real quick Western Governors University does affordable um competency-based master's degrees and bachelor's degrees so if you are looking to do a degree i did not talk about this i do talk about it in the book mm -hmm. um they're they're an affordable option they're not cheap but they're more affordable than your typical university because they're built completely online they were built for online learners so perfect but going back to the, the question um i would look for show your work look for the good price and look at which uh experience is better because honestly there's such variety in there. So if you can get an idea of what the teaching style is like, are you getting support? Are you getting job coaching out of it? Uh, and so on. Those are those supplemental things can help you make the decision. Hmm. Uh, which learning path is more in demand, specialist or generalist? Hmm. That's a tough one. Hmm. So that's a tough one. I would say that as it helps to be a generalist because when you're a generalist, you can apply your skills in different ways. 
-hmm. right? So when I go back to like that, looking at like the three categories of skills, your power skills, analytical tech skills, but having, but also, so it's like the T-shaped person, right? We've seen T-shaped where it's like, you've got, you know, across the board knowledge and skills here, but you go deep on one thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you had to tell me what I could go deep on, it's easily communication, 100% mm -hmm. writing, speaking, collaborating, research, yeah. right? It's all there, but across the board, I've, I've certainly got everything from like program management to, um, to tech at this point, because I can work with um, software and design, you know, work in the AI space. I could say maybe I might be deep on AI right now, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to depend. I, what I'd like is for you, you know, when we're thinking about career changes, we don't forget our expertise. You're not going to lose that expertise and you're actually going to be surprised how that expertise is going to reshape um, and support you in your next career choice right? You're never starting over. Okay. All right. All right. I have a question. Um, so I've connected with someone who is from higher ed and he was laid off. He's a professor, was laid off. And so uh, because of that, he ended up starting a, I want to say a group, although he doesn't have a Facebook group or a movement uh, where he wants to help people from higher ed be able to communicate what they know, what they've done, not the piece yeah. of paper. What have you yeah. done? And how you can transfer that to whether it's corporate, just private work, right? Yes. Outside of academia. Yes. And we had a conversation yesterday. He can't get on today, but I'm going to definitely send him the link. But uh, it was a great conversation because we're doing kind of similar work. And I would want to know your take on um, these people definitely need more tech right yes. it's from the, oh. the academic world yes. right um, <laughs> i used to work in higher ed twice yes. so yes yes and so do through your experience nicole how and i don't know if the book has it and i do have the book i got it on a kindle just funny. Okay. um so do you have any resources or how do you recommend someone do that self-assessment of this is what I have and what I know, like how, I don't know if you've even, if, you, if you've gone that deep with it. So like, how do you even do that self-assessment? And I'll just say yeah. this because so, while not academia, not many people in the group are from academia, but that yeah. is a challenge that most, uh, quite a few of our members have as they are trying to transition to something else, not, not figuring out how to just do that self-assessment to see, yeah you know, what is this skill and how could it be applied somewhere else? Do you have any resources for that? Or? Yeah, this is, I just want to validate that too, because this is honestly the hardest part. Mm, okay. All right. um, it is, we have shifted from an experience economy where it's like, you've got to have seven years experience and yeah. a degree and then you're it, right? To like, you've got to be able to do these things. Yeah. And we're in a skills-based economy and no one's taught us. Um, so I do talk about it in the book, but like, let's put that aside. I talk about doing like a skills inventory where you actually write your resume out in real language. You're not writing, you're not trying to write in that weird resume speech. <laughs> you know, nobody yes. to do that. Like I do because I've you know <laughs> reviewed too many resumes. Um, but so a couple of things you can do: literally sit down and write out what you did. Mm. If you were a professor, what did you do? Okay, you taught, you graded, you coached, mm. right? Did you um, did you do grant proposals? Did you um, facilitate conversations? You know, mm. really think through because I think what we do is we, we're so we're so familiar with our work that we don't we're like yeah I did that. Right, but we don't like break down what does that work i've been a program manager well what does that mean you know yeah. um for example i was a travel writer for a while and people just assume that like you just go off and write in fancy destinations <laughs> but i did not in fact i didn't travel um oh. which surprised to me i thought that would be the job uh, but <laughs> Instead, I was interviewing people. I was, mm -hmm. I actually go, I break this down in the book, but I interviewed people. I learned how to use a CMS. So I was uploading content mm -hmm. to WordPress and Drupal later. Um, I learned how to edit photography and upload photography, right? I learned how to make my content look nice in a newsletter. I learned how to um, read analytics mm -hmm. from newsletters that were opened, right? Because I had someone that worked on the data side and taught me that. And so it's, it's really breaking down what you've done and getting, mm. getting deep about it deep sounds weird, mm. but like diving into it and not just kind of saying like, oh yeah, I managed this program. Yeah. Right? That's, yeah. That's and then the second thing is going back to those job descriptions. Mm -hmm. If you can get a job description of like, that's similar to what you did, mm. that also helps put it in a perspective. You say, oh, I did that. And yeah. also I did the other thing over here that that's not on here. Right. 
Mm. Talking to your coworker. What do you think I did in my job? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> no, maybe they don't. Where's your work bestie or your work husband, right? Like, <laughs> what do you see me doing? All of these are ways to do that. A career coach, absolutely. Yes. Will help that. But not everyone can afford that or has the mm-hmm. time for that. So these are some ways that you can self-reflect and do that. Um, there is a tool that I want to say it's, um, it's through MZ. They're an economic modeling data firm, um, but I follow them, E-M-S-I. And they currently have, um, I'll send it, I'll post it in the group. Oh, perfect, they, perfect. They have a skill, like a, it's like a skill matcher where they like actually like help you break down the skills you have. Hmm. And then also the skills you want to match you with things. Okay. So I'm being vague. There's a couple of them and I, there's two of these and I can't remember which one goes where, but I'll do some research and put it in the group because those tools are actually really powerful right now. And they're not perfect, but I think they're getting closer to what we need for people that need to figure out their skill sets. Perfect. And I will keep connect you with Eric. Uh, yeah, I can would, he's doing some interesting work as well. Yeah. Uh, all right. This super, is the last to net. super connected to that. <laughs> this is the last question I have in the chat, but then of course I have my questions and guys, while I, when I ask my questions, if you have any last comments or questions, please drop them. Okay. So, uh, thanks so much, Nicole. T-shape is quite an interesting path to pursue. You don't get bored. Perfect. All right. <laughs> and then I think I've said this, but I'm going to let you know, uh, Nicole is in our group and she's a very active member of our group. So definitely um, connect with her. Remember when you connect, you have to tell her you're a member of CDPD. You can tell her something about this presentation and that you'd like to connect. All right. So let me put my video on and we'll get ready for my questions. Great and question. Guys, again. <laughs> drop any last questions before I get to my final question I like my final question to be the final question I have three <laughs> <laughs> so Nicole uh, CDPD's mission is to increase marginalized and BIPOC groups access to employment opportunities and representation in the workforce by mm-hmm. providing our members with free training mentorship and other resources CDPD was created in response to record unemployment and underemployment rates stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Uh, So my question to you, Nicole, is uh, keeping in mind that we never marginalize, well, we could marginalize ourselves, but usually we don't, Mm -hmm. that uh, people marginalize us because they are, um, they see something great in us, maybe get a little little scared of it, or they have very small minds. So my question to you is if you've ever been marginalized and if so, can you share with us how or why you, you, you believe you were marginalized? Well, yeah. Uh, so I'm queer. Uh, I am, I have a a partner, my wife, uh, and it is certainly one of those things where you've, I've been in work environments where people make, uh, comments uh, Mm -hmm. about either me, uh, not necessarily me, but like being weirded out by queer culture or even um, trans people, which are part of my culture as well. Um, And it's uh, certainly caused me to wonder, am I being judged then unfairly if something happens? I've had bosses make comments about it. Um, And so I think it's, you know, to point to specific instances, I've had one boss definitely make a comment, uh, but I've also had other bosses that really supported me and were like, hey, could you please, uh, you know, be visible for all of our queer people here? (laughs) I was like, certainly. Um, I'm fortunate to live in a very uh, accepting place, so I have that, but uh, I, I will say just building on that when you, that idea of bringing your authentic self to work is sometimes really hard for queer people. Yeah. And so I've certainly felt based on comments that I would need to dial back my authentic mm-hmm. self. And I mean, this is how I am, like how I am now is how I am. Yeah, but time. it was a journey. Yeah. And I think especially since when I first became in a relationship with a woman, it was certainly a lot of fear around that mm-hmm. <laughs> about coming out at work. And because you're a lot of times it, you have to come out a lot and mm-hmm. or you do um, what is it you have to do like linguistic tricks. Mm. to not mention your mm. to really out yourself and so mm. I used to work with an international population and that made it even harder because mm. you're working with people from all over the world and you want to mm. assume best yes. intentions but you also don't want to you know cause anything else to come into this relationship mm-hmm. and so you hide yourself for it yeah and so even though you're not trying to marginalize yourself you do you in do. some ways mm-hmm. yeah. um so yeah I think it's mm-hmm. a I'm you know out proud I shaved my head because I was like, look how gay it makes me look. I love it. Hey, hey. Uh, this is, um, you know, I asked the question, uh, if you've never been on a, one of our, our webinars, 
I ask this question because I want us all to know that if we are marginalized or if we have been marginalized, that all of our presenters is this, well, one said she didn't think she was marginalized, but then she thought about it and said, yeah, she's a black female. So that okay. was interesting. Um, yeah. But uh, I asked the question, guys, so that you can see that if you've been marginalized or if you're currently feeling like you're marginalized, that we have so many, we've had 36 people now. I think you're the 33rd, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> but we have 36, three more that I have scheduled who have come in and talked to us and have, have shown us that in spite of being marginalized, they still became successful in whatever they're doing um and, and you can too so that's why we asked that question um, yeah, I'm glad you do I think it's a it's a really powerful question to ask yeah and it, I mean I think that it, it's it's given me so much hope uh, for things that I still you know struggle with today mm -hmm. and even me I still have issues with certain yeah. things uh and one day guys I'll give you my my journey but we I don't want it to be about me so I will listen to that journey <laughs> I'll be like click what time <laughs> Because you told me some of your story and I just, it's fascinating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, my second question, and I see that we have a question in the chat, guys, drop anything else and I will, I'm going to cover it after this one and then I'll ask my final question. My second question is, uh, oh, oh, before I get there, I'll tell you, we had Dominique Revere, who is also um, queer and she's an HR person you know, an HR professional. And she I think I talking. follow her. I think I follow her on LinkedIn. Oh yeah, she's, she's yes. amazing. Amazing. Yes. Her presentation here was amazing. Um, she uh, noted that because of the work that she does in the HR space, that she had to be more guarded about her personal sexuality, you know, her personal preferences. And for a long time she was, and she talks about 12 years not being her authentic self at work. Mm -hmm. And for 12 years, just going there, putting my head down and working and expecting someone to see my greatness, you know, mm -hmm. through the work. And then now she says, yeah, I have to show up and I'm me. You know, if I want to wear red sneakers, rainbow sneakers, I wear them. If I, you know, on my desk, I don't have to tell you, but there's a picture of my wife and children on my desk, you know, and I love it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it just so we have some some great, great people in the group. Uh, so I will ask you, uh, Nicole, um, what would you tell your younger self? Just considering your whole journey, uh, what is if you could just tap Nicole on her shoulder when she began, what would you want to whisper in her ear? Yeah, it's so funny. I would want to be like, I'd be like, you're going to be okay. <laughs> All right. I did not take, I did not, I took a crazy path. Like uh, so much of my twenties was just taking jobs, really crappy jobs. So I could travel yeah. abroad or go yeah. live in another country. I went to grad school abroad. So like my whole, but I had everybody being like, you're going to wreck your career. You're going to wreck your career. <laughs> you're going to wreck your career. Yeah. Like so much. And, and like, you, you kind of internalize that. You're like, yeah. I'm yeah. still going to do this, but I must be a misfit. I am a total misfit. Right. And do so you internalize that and you start to yeah. doubt yourself. Right. Yeah. And so I think like, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm confident now, but like, mm -hmm. as you know, like 20 mid twenties and stuff, just being like, well, clearly I'm, I'm a misfit. Yeah. What am I going to do? You know, you're okay. You're okay. You were just ahead of your game with everybody else. All also. right. Yeah. They had to catch up <laughs> to you and some haven't still haven't. Right. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's just the reality and I embrace it. I just embrace it. So, so I tell myself to just kind of like, it's okay. It's going to work out because everyone else was like, what are you doing? Oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. I want you to come back, Nicole. So let me get these last two questions from the group and then I'm going to ask you my final question. So, okay. This is a comment and it's, it's perfect. Thanks. Thanks to Nett and Nicole for the brilliant presentation. There is so much to learn, even though AI has entered our lives. This is true. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I like this one. Nicole, what do you do to keep that great upbeat energy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know is like how I am <laughs> even on stage like my favorite thing is like talking mm -hmm. to people in I can tell. and then okay. like when I'm on stage I'm just like I'm not on stage because COVID but like <laughs> I'm also an extreme extrovert it's terrible like, oh you are okay okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's funny so because funny. some people have come here and they've been like you and gave these amazing presentations and then say I'm an introvert and I'm like huh but I understand I it yeah I, I understand my partner it is that way she is like okay. super like you would not know her and like, <laughs> be like all cheery 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 like talks to everybody and then comes home and like 
only wants to be home. And I'm like, but why? (laughs) (laughs) It's been tough on, like, COVID's tough on for a million reasons, but certainly Uh for the who are just like, yeah. I got called out by a friend the other day because I was talking to a five year old so much, and they were like, why are you talking to this five year old? I (laughs) just want to talk. I need to talk. (laughs) I need it. See me. So All right, it. guys, this has been great. This has been really, really cool, Nicole. Oh, well, another one popped up. All right, guys, this is your last call. I'm going to ring my last call bell. All right. I love your energy. Great that you love speaking and you are helping people to improve themselves. Yes, I love it. I definitely love that too. All right, guys, this is my final question. Um, and uh, so, Nicole, uh, everything we spoke about today or if there's anything that you didn't say, you know, what would you want us to have one takeaway? Either something you covered or something you didn't. Yeah, um, I will tell you this. Uh, I talk about this a lot. Embrace your curiosity. Um, we've been taught a lot. Find your passion. I think find your passion's good, but it doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. So if you're like, I don't know what my passion is, mm-hmm. focus on your curiosity. What are you curious about? And go after it. And maybe you find out like. You know, that's not for me. I'm not curious anymore. <laughs> totally fine. Find something else and, and, and chase it. Uh, this, is, this is less pressure, right? Than finding that one true passion. Yes. And it allows you the space to change and evolve throughout your career, right? We are not, the, I'm not the same person I was in my 20s as I am now at 41. Like yeah. I should change. Mm-hmm. So it's that curiosity that really can drive you and um, help you find the opportunities that really are a match for you. Wow, I love it. And uh, we have to end now, but again, we, we've given you the open invite. Uh, yeah. I definitely know I'd love you to come and just talk about your journey okay. and then <laughs> anything else you want, but I'm going to ask the group too, because they, they always come up with such good stuff. I'm not such a visionary all the time, uh, <laughs> but I really appreciate this. I thank you so much. Of course, I thank you so much for the Business Insider. You put CDPD on the map for real. Yeah, uh, you did all the work. <laughs> You guys do all the heavy lifting, all the presenters and the group members. This is fun for me. This is like, I'm having fun. Uh, so I thank you. And this is, this is the first you, everyone who jumped into this, no one left. So we always have people leave. So you kept everyone in this. So I'm, this is why I'm so, you know, glad that we weren't able to go live, but I'm going to, I'm going to host a watch party of this oh, okay. once I um, post it up so that okay. we can all watch this together and, and and get people on this one because there's a lot of good information for people. Yeah. Uh, and I'll jump group. in the group. If you do that and there's questions there out, I can jump in the group later and answer them. So yes, yes. Happy okay. to do that. Okay. It's perfect. Well, all right, well, thank you perfect. everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. All right, then have a great evening. All right, take care. All right, bye-bye. Bye.